okay. Um, there we are. We've got, there's still people joining, but um, I'll, I'll make a start. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming along this evening to our Young Rail Professionals uh, webinar on the history of rail in Wales. Uh, my name's Zoe Brooks. I'm a committee member at YRP Wales. And just for those of you who may not know, just uh, just a bit of background. Uh, Young Rail Professionals were a non-for-profit organisation with the intention of promoting the rail industry as just a great place to work, um, inspiring the next generation of railway talent and helping develop young people to reach their potential. It's, um, it's completely free to become a member and yeah, we're always on the lookout for new members and potential new volunteer committee members. So we do a lot of events like this, some online, some in person. Um, yeah, some of them are a bit more educational like this one. Some of them are entirely social, um, like sort of quizzes, pub quizzes. Some, some are a nice mix of both, a bit of education, a bit of socializing. Um, so, for example, this week, so Thursday the 27th, we've got our YRP Wales virtual social, um, which is just a chance for you to get to know other uh, YRP members, other yeah, young professionals in the rail industry. There'll be some online games that you can put you into rooms and you can interact with someone. And oh, and most importantly, you get a you'll get a voucher for a free takeaway, which you can order at the start, eat that and get to know people. So yeah, any, so if you want any information about that event, so any information about any national or regional YRP events, then you can just go to the Young Rail Professionals website and yeah, there's information about becoming a member and yeah, also there's an events page with all the events information. So yeah, more importantly, back to this event. It's um, hosted, yeah, hosted by James Bennett, um, colleague of mine and fellow uh, Wales committee member, and yeah, head of no chair, sorry, chair of YRP Wales and interim chair of regions. And you can reintroduce yourself if I got any of that in the wrong order. And yeah, just just general fountain of rail knowledge. So if um, if you do have any questions, you can just put them in the sort of go to webinar chat and we'll have time to address them at the end. So yeah, once again, thanks for attending. And yeah, take it away, James. Cool. Thanks, Zoe. Uh, thanks, everyone for coming. Um, so this is a presentation I've delivered um, so internally to TFW staff and also now delivering to IRP. Uh, I'll try not to kind of take it too long. There's a heck of a lot um, of history uh, within the Welsh rail industry. Uh, it is in some ways the birthplace of railways in the world, as you will um, find out shortly. So this is just going to be a kind of rough overview, um, you know, particularly aimed at uh, those of you who are new to the rail industry, you're not quite sure about uh, some of the aspects of um, how the rail industry came to be uh, and how the current work that Transport for Wales are doing and other rail operators such as Avanti West Coast Great Western are doing to improve um, the rail services in Wales. Kind of, th this is the context for what's happening and um, why that's so important and so extensive. So to begin with, uh, this may be the sort of image of Welsh railways that you may um, kind of have in mind, particularly if you're not from Wales. Uh, this, of course, is Ivor the Engine, um, you know, a very famous and beloved cartoon or animation, I should say, uh, from 1960s which depicts a rural railway line called the uh, Mariana Atlantic City Railway Traction Company Limited. Um, and just a little steam engine chugging up and down. 
a, a lonely branch line with a, a regular cast around it. Now, yes, certain elements of Welsh railways were like that, but not all of them. And I want to highlight first um, this map. This is from the brilliant railmaponline.com. It's a map of all of the railways in Wales uh, that have ever been built, pretty much. Um, so you can see, looking at this map, you can see a number of different sort of um, regional breakdowns in terms of um, character. So you can see in the bottom right, you've got Southeast Wales, the Southeast Wales coal field, uh, massive industrial centre, um, lots of branch lines leading down to the various docks along the coast, Cardiff, Swansea, Barry, Newport. And um, lots of different colours. Each colour represents a different railway company. So the sort of turquoisey green that you can see, that's the Great Western Railway. Uh, the purple is London Northwestern. Um, they were the two main railway companies in Wales. We'll kind of go into more of a historical breakdown of some of the more important companies uh, shortly. But um, you can see all of these companies kind of building lines, often two or three per valley, competing with each other for that very, very lucrative uh, industrial traffic. By contrast, if you look out in West Wales, very sparsely populated area, very sparse rail network with lots of long rambling branch lines. Um, then you kind of have to North Wales where you see something similar, but quite a few of those lines in that area are narrow gauge lines. A lot of them are still around today as part of the Great Little Trains of Wales. Top right-hand corner, northeast, you've got the industrial belt around Wrexham. And then you kind of move further down to Mid Wales where again, you kind of have um, a couple of cross-country lines. Uh, the Cambrian railways were really dominant here. So you've got a different um, picture depending on which part of Wales you're in. People think of Wales as this one kind of whole country, but really it's quite stark how much of a divide there is between different parts of Wales and the railway network's a good way of reflecting that. Uh, you can contrast that with the rail network today. So um, this is by and large the national network. There's also the uh, narrow gauge heritage railways on there as well. But uh, you can see that the rural railway network in West Wales was decimated and through mid Wales. Um, even the valleys network is very, very much a shadow of its former self. But the main arteries through North Wales, South Wales and the borders are all still there, sort of um, holding it all together. But that borders line, the marches line through Hereford and Shrewsbury, obviously that goes into England. Um, so the main way to get from North Wales to South Wales is to go via England, which is in and of itself um, something that has been politically contentious in recent years. So we'll go back to the start. 1804, uh, Richard Trevithick, who was a Cornish engineer, uh, was challenged to build a ste working steam locomotive for uh, the Penadaran tramway, which was linking um, the Penadaran uh, ironworks in uh, Merthyr Tydfil with the Glamorganshire Canal in Abercunnan. Uh, on the 21st of February, it successfully hauled its first ever train. Um, and then um, kind of had a short period of use after that. It's generally regarded as the first successful um, steam locomotive that hauled a train, albeit very, very slowly and usually breaking the track because back then the rails were cast iron, they weren't as strong. And as you can see from the picture, this is the replica, which is based at the uh, Waterfront Museum in Swansea. It's a big old machine and it vibrated a lot and moved around a lot. It was very, very primitive. Um, but yeah, Wales effectively the birthplace of the steam locomotive, albeit by a Cornish engineer. Um, and then from, from then, the, the, obviously the design is kind of picked up a little bit later on uh, by George and Robert Stevenson refined when you kind of see the Stockton, Darlington, Liverpool, and Manchester, which are the first kind of proper steam hauled railways um, but the work that Trevithick did was a huge part uh, contributing towards that and next up you've also got the world's first fair pairing passenger railway service which was the Mumbles Railway which started running in 1807 it was a horse-drawn tramway initially steam locomotives uh, then came in later on and electric tram cars so this was um, a, a railway that started in the um, town centre, now the city centre of Swansea, ran along the coast. If, if any of you um, 
have been to Swansea. Uh, a lot of this is now a road and a cycle and footpath along the coast down towards Oystermouth um, and then eventually around to the pier at Mumbles. Um, this ran for 150, over 150 years. Um, in the end, bus competition um, kind of led to its demise, but um, it's an important part of the industrial history of Swansea and you know, a massive landmark you know, as the first service that people could pay to use like this that was actually running on rails. And, you know, with the Swansea Bay Metro coming in the future, you know, maybe uh, we'll see this sort of thing in Swansea again many, many years down the line. So then it, it, then after the um, kind of the success of the Stockton, Darlington, Liverpool, Manchester and other railways in England, you do start to see uh, more railway companies uh, appearing in South Wales in particular from the 1830s onwards. The Taft Vale Railway was the most important of these. So it was founded to build a railway that basically would replace the Glamorganshire Canal between um, Cardiff and Abercannon and um, also then linking up to Merthyr um, to replace the Penadaran Tram Road. The first section was opened in 1840. Uh, it's one of the railways that uh, was engineered by Isabad Kingdom Brunel. It's one of the ones that's sort of a bit forgotten. Obviously, everyone remembers Brunel for his work on the Great Western Railway, but he did actually also um, build the Taffail Railway as well. This then um, extended up to Merthyr uh, in time. And this is the um, what is now the Merthyr line of the uh, Core Valley Lines Network, the South Wales Metro. Um, the Taffail um, quickly kind of um, started spreading throughout the other valleys, it was through the Cunnan Valley to Aberdeer, um, then the Ronde Vaux up to Treherba. Uh, it did a branch line from Pontypris to Llantrisant, and then on, eventually up to Mardi on the Ronde Vaux, which was the highest point of the system. Um, and they also went down to the Vale Glamorgan, where uh, they were a big part of the development of the docks of Panath and built a branch line from Llantrisant to Ketter Ridge and then on to Abathor. So they became you know, a very wealthy company. Um, they, they were the first ones to kind of really tap into the coal traffic. Uh, the Ronda Valley was, of course, a um, massive centre for the coal industry, lots and lots of collieries. Um, and Merthyr remained a, a big industrial centre as well for many years to come. So they had kind of first dibs on a lot of those uh, places. And other companies would then start to kind of creep in on their territory, um, building lines that were parallel to try and take some of the traffic away from the Taffail. And there were often kind of um, moments of um, tension between the two. So for instance, when the Cardiff Railway was built, which was directly built by um, the, the Cardiff Docks, the Boot Docks company, they um, built a line that ran parallel to the Taffail as far as to Forest, where they built a junction with the Taffail, but the Taffail weren't very happy about this and eventually got an injunction on the Cardiff Railway being able to run trains. Um, and that junction was only ever used for the opening train on the opening day. So um, that was that's to give you an example of the level of competition and the level of um, rivalry between a lot of these companies in South Wales. Um, also in South Wales, the Great Western Railway. So uh, they were founded in 1835 to link London and Bristol, which was one of the biggest cities in the UK at the time. But then they were also uh, looking to expand into South Wales. So um, they built a railway between Chepstow and Swansea in 1850 via their satellite company, the South Wales Railway. Uh, and then the picture on the bottom left, which you can see there, that's the uh, bridge over the River Wye at Chepstow, which was originally uh, designed again by Brunel in a very similar style to the Royal Albert Bridge in Plymouth as a sort of smaller version of that. It ended up being, being rebuilt into the more conventional form that it is today. But once that opened in 1851, there was then a continuous railway between Gloucester and Swansea. So effectively, you could run a train from London to Swansea via Gloucester. Uh, it wasn't until 1886 that you had the, the route that we see today via the Seven Tunnel when that opened after a very long and difficult construction period. Um, but in the meantime, the Great Western was also expanding its influence in the valleys. It took on a few, uh, a few of the smaller companies in the valleys and managed to kind of spread its way northward. So you could see in the um, map earlier, you can see like particularly around 
Bridgend and the Bridgend Valleys, they managed to kind of expand upwards. And they also did um, some links with some of the other valleys companies for joint railways and ran the Cross Valleys line between Pontypool and Neath, um, which was a very important link across all of the valleys. Obviously, most of the um, railways kind of go down the valleys. There were one or two that went across, which um, was important from a freight perspective. So um, they also require, acquired the East Midlands Railway, which was the what is now the Marches Line between Newport and Hereford as well. So a massive influential company, um, you know, in the in the area, and would eventually take over the running of nearly all the railways in South Wales um, in the 20th century. But we'll come to that in a short while. Up in North Wales. The uh, Chester and Holyhead Railway was built in it between 1844 and 1850 as a way of reaching Holyhead, which is an important port over to Ireland. Uh, it was engineered by Robert Stevenson, who had um, also built uh, Rocket and done a lot of the engineering work on um, what is now the West Coast Main Line. And he designed the two tubular bridges over um, the River Conway in Conway, next to Conway Castle, one of the most spectacular bridges in the country, and over the Menai Strait, uh, the Britannia Bridge, which uh, was later rebuilt after a fire. In its original form, you can see it on the left-hand side there with the lions, which are still there today, although you can't see them because the road deck's in the way. Um, in 1848, um, you had the first named express train, the Irish Mail, uh, in the world. That began operating between London and North Wales. And that was all eventually um, absorbed into what became the London and North Western Railway, uh, which then became the dominant railway company in North Wales. And of course, not to leave, uh, leave out one of the more famous bits of trivia in Welsh railways, um, that North Wales coastline, of course, includes which is hard to say if your mouth dry like mine is right now. But uh, yes, a bit of a tourist gimmick. It was um, its official name is Lambay Push, but um, it has for over a hundred years been the longest railway station name in the world unofficially. Um, then you've got Mid Wales and the Cambrian Railways, as mentioned earlier, were the dominant company here. So the first railway in in Mid Wales was the Newtown and Llanidloes Railway, which opened in 1859 which linked two of the more important market towns. And from there, the Cambrian network kind of spread out in both directions, uh, eventually kind of spread over the border to Whitchurch in Shropshire and up to Wrexham. Um, but westwards is the more famous element of um, expansion, whereby um, it was two entrepreneurs, David Davis and Thomas Savin, who um, pushed for the Cambrian Railway to go west. David Davis ended up playing a big role in, in South Wales as well. He was the man behind the building of Barry Docks. Um, but he played a big role in the uh, expansion of the Cambrian. And Thomas Savin was a very ambitious entrepreneur who saw the potential of uh, West and North Wales as a tourist destination. Um, he built uh, the massive hotel on one of the, the biggest hotel on the front in um, Aberystwyth. Unfortunately, he was a bit of a man uh, before his time and the expense of building the railway ended up um, leaving him uh, financially ruined. But um, of course, many years later, this would become an important holiday destination. And the Cambrian Railways played a big part in bringing people to, uh, to the West Wales coast. It did take some time to get to that and it took quite a lot of extensions of the railway network. And, um, and it's, it's also a very, um, slow railway as well which which is kind of seen today the very low average speed does take time to get from one end to another which didn't lend itself to kind of uh, express trains but um it did spread right the way up the coast eventually to Pathelli and um with a lot of small branch lines as you can see here as well and eventually down to Brecon as well via the Mid Wales Railway So in 1923, um, the many, many railway companies of Britain, and in particular in Wales, there were um, lots of very, very small concerns, along with uh, some big ones who kind of 
dominated each part of the country. They were all grouped together into what were known as the big four. Um, of those four companies, three of them had a presence in Wales. A lot of people don't know this, but the LNER actually had a very small number of stations and railway lines in Wales, but primarily it was the Great Western Railway and the London Midland and Scottish Railway. So the Great Western dominated in South Wales, West Wales and up through Mid Wales, and then the LMS was the dominant company in North Wales. Now, of course, the 1930s after this became uh, what is known as the golden era of rail travel, where there's this view of sort of luxury and um, high speeds, big, powerful locomotives. Um, but also, you know, for Wales in particular, uh, the railways played a big part of the development of tourism, particularly along the North Wales coast, with places like Rill and Prestate and Colwyn Bay becoming big holiday destinations. And also, as mentioned, on the Cambrian coast as well, places like Barmouth and Porth Madog. And you gradually kind of see this um, blossoming of Wales as a tourist destination. However, um, it wasn't all like this. You know, down in South Wales, the railways were a big part of uh, keeping Wales functioning and, um, you know, powering the industrial um processes of kind of bringing coal from the collieries to the ports and shipping it abroad. Around this time you do see the, the peaking of coal in Wales. There is a sort of slow decline from around 100 years ago from the 1920s onwards. And then of course through the 1940s the, the war, World War II, um, caused a lot of damage to the railway network. Rolling stock starts to get older. Uh, each of the railway companies start to get in quite a considerable amount of debt. And uh, eventually in 1948, uh, the railways were nationalized to form British Railways. Um, so this is definitely a kind of broader picture um, than just Wales, but um, it's worth including as context. Anyway, um, nationalization obviously led to British Railways taking on a lot of debt um, and then those losses mounted in the 1950s, you see road transport becoming uh, a viable option for people, particularly in rural areas. Um, and then there's also the expense of the modernization plan where um, steam locomotives were slowly being phased out and replaced by diesels and electrics. A lot of them were very experimental. And over the 1950s and 1960s, you also start to see a lot of uh, underutilized railway lines in rural parts of the country, particularly Wales. Um, start to get chopped. Now, obviously, uh, everyone associates this with Dr. Beecham, but actually a lot of railways in Wales were already started to close before Dr. Beecham's infamous report, uh, the reshaping of British Railways, which led to uh, the closure of about a third of the railway network. A decent chunk of it in Wales had already gone by this point. However, uh, particularly the valleys were, the South Wales valleys were really badly affected by the reshaping report because it led to the closure of a lot of the duplicate railway lines, um, our lines like the Cross Valley Line, which was which was very um, expensive to maintain because of all the structures. Um, they were all sort of cut back, and of course there was uh, there were further proposals to reduce the rail network even further, which would have left very little left in Wales at all. Like there would have been no valleys network to speak of at all you would have ended up with a sort of partial network with the main lines in North and South Wales, and that's about it. Um, and of course, you know, as these closures uh, continue, actually the railways continue to lose a lot of money. And, um, you know, there's some debate as to whether or not um, the closure programme should have been brought into place. I will leave that one for, uh, for you to kind of decide upon. I'm sure lots of you are well aware of this part of the history of Britain's railways. But the impact on Wales was particularly significant because we had such a big rural network. Um, those railways were the first to go. And um, that's why you've go, go for a situation where you had lots of railway lines covering different parts of Wales to a very, very bare network that we see today. And of course, another part uh, of the railway story that um, Wales played a role in was through the Wooden Brothers scrapyard in Barry, where Many, many steam locomotives were taken um, initially to be scrapped, although Di Woodham, the owner of the scrapyard, decided not to scrap them. He wanted initially to store them for 
uh, his men to have work, quote, on a rainy day, because they also had a lot of wagons, coal wagons to scrap as well. So they concentrated on scrapping them. And that, of course, attracted the attention of uh, steam locomotive enthusiasts who would eventually buy up nearly all of the locomotives there and restore them to work in order, which is a big part of the railway heritage, heritage movement, a massive part of the British tourism industry. Um, and that was almost entirely down to the Barry Scrapyard, because without the Barry Scrapyard, if, if Woodham had scrapped all those locomotives, very, very few would have survived. We wouldn't have anywhere near as many heritage railways as we do today. So um, after years of underinvestment in the Welsh Railway Network in particular, um, British Rail started to invest in brand new trains in the 1980s. They formed their region, um, their divisions, so the intercity uh, division and the provincial or regional railways uh, division were formed. These helped revitalize Wales' railways. So intercity, um, you know, they had brought in the intercity 125, the HSTs, which uh, first ran between London and Wales um, and then the London to Swansea route became a, a key part of the intercity network. And then the investment in new trains for the regional railways network with trains like the, the Sprinters and of course the dreaded Pacers helped replace a lot of older trains and provided an improved service for people. And suddenly you started seeing a lot more people using the trains, particularly in South Wales with the valleys, you start to see passenger numbers creep up, more frequent services coming in. A lot of stations and lines started to be reopened so the Aberdeer line was reopened in this time. The Cardiff City line was uh, open to passengers for the first time. And all of this is kind of building the basis for what would go on to become the South Wales Metro in years to come. Before we got to that point, um, obviously in the 1990s, the process of privatisation uh, began. So a whole raft of new train operating companies were formed and Wales was particularly fragmented. It's a very different situation to Scotland where the ScotRail uh, franchise took on all of the local services in Scotland and it was treated almost as one network. In Wales, you didn't have that. Have that. You had the Valleys network was split off into its own franchise, the Valley Lines. You had Wales and West, which took on a lot of the services in South Wales and down into the southwest of England. You had Northwestern Trains, which became First Northwestern, which took over the services in North Wales. You had Central Trains taking over the Cambrian. There was no real kind of um, all Wales train operator until you reach the early 2000s and this starts becoming a bit of a political issue. Uh, and eventually from 2003, the Wales and Borders franchise was formed and awarded to Arriva um, for 15 years. Um, so then we get on to the contemporary situation and the future. So Transport for Wales was formed in 2016 by the Welsh Government as an arm's length body then that would initially oversee the procurement of the next Wales and Borders Operator and Development Partner or ODP, so the next franchise holder. But it was done by a slightly different procurement process because it also included uh, the development of the South Wales Metro, which was gonna involve infrastructure work as well as operations uh, of rail services, which makes it different from, from operators in England. So this was all completed in 2018 with the uh, with the awarding of the contract to Keolis Amy, um, who were then operate as Transport for Wales Rail Services from October 2018. In 2019, uh, TFW Rail Services operated the most services on the uh, Wales and Borders network in its entire history, which kind of shows in some respects how far we've come in the sense of we have a much smaller network now, but services are so much more frequent that we're still able to run more services today, or at least pre-COVID, than back in a day when you had this big expansive network. And then in 2020, just as the COVID-19 pandemic was starting, um, Transport for Wales acquired the Core Valley Lines from Network Rail, which then officially kickstarted the process of the development of the South Wales Metro, uh, which is going to lead to more frequent, uh, faster services, electrification, um, and that is all going to be completed over the next uh, couple of years. Um, currently work is well underway, building the new tram train depot in Taft's Well and 
uh, putting up the electric masts across the CVL network so that uh, we can start running those tram trains, which you can see in the bottom right-hand corner. And of course, the other impact of COVID-19 was um, the transfer of the Wales and Borders Rail Service to Transport for Wales Rail Limited, which is um, a subsidiary of Transport for Wales. Um, they took over from Keolis Amy. And um, as a result, uh, so TFW Group, as it now is, is kind of working really closely with Amy Infrastructure Wales to deliver the transformation of the Metro, uh, as well as to continue the operation of Wales and Borders Rail Services. And that is pretty much where we are. We're going to see um, over the next few years, a lot of new trains. It's going to be an almost complete fleet replacement for the whole uh, of the network. And, uh, you know, we're going to see more new stations and potentially in the future, you may see the uh, expansion of the network. Some of those lines that were, re um, were closed in the 1960s could be reopened. Some of the stations that were closed in the past, as well as new stations. Um, you know, the future is looking a lot brighter than it did 30, 40 years ago. And it's going to be very exciting to be a part of that at TFW. So are there any questions? I can't see any, but please feel free to um, to share them in the co in the question section on the right hand side. Okay, cool. Well, we give it um, give people a couple of minutes. I appreciate that was a lot to take in. Have you got any questions, Zoe? Um, I don't, sorry, but um, no, thanks for that. Yeah, we are like dash through history. I'm guessing, is that your sort of condensed version? Incredibly condensed. I think when I originally did the draft of this, um, I had sections on a lot more of the South Wales Railway companies. And because the, the histories of them are all very interesting, particularly the Barry Railway, which kind of came in later on, it was owned by David Davis, who also played a role in the Cambrian Railway. So he built Barry Docks and then built this railway network deliberately to serve it, which then stretched up into the valleys and ran parallel. It was almost like the Great Central Railway. For those of you who know your railway history, the Great Central Railway of the valleys, because it was all built to a much higher standard, big uh, viaducts and tunnels and four track railway. And um, nearly all of that network is gone now. But uh, it just kind of shows the how how much money was at play, relatively speaking, and again that level of rivalry between all the different companies in South Wales. There are so many of them, um, which you know even in other parts of Wales you don't really see. I think the only places in Britain that you really see a similar level of competition is uh, parts of Yorkshire and the area around Manchester. Um, even in London, it's you can. From a freight, certainly from a freight perspective, you don't get that level of competition. It is a dense, dense network, and I would implore everyone to look at RailMap online and look at some of the sort of local positions of all of the different railways next to each other and the, all the stations being next to each other and, and things like that. It's fascinating. I I yeah, love spending hours you, doing um, it. Yeah, you showed me before, and it's yeah really handy and being able to sort of turn on and off layers and look at the current railways and historical railways and yeah really like user-friendly handy resource we do have a question in so um oh, well jamie spotted. asks where did the lner operate so the lner um had a small incursion into wales around wrexham so what is now wrexham central station that was on a line that was that became part of the LNER. And I think it was then the um, the line that headed north. It might even have been the Wrexham Bidston line. I can't remember. I'll, I'll just check on my phone to get the exact um, sort of breakdown of it. But yeah, it was it basically in, in the Wrexham area, Northeast Wales, where it, because of the companies that it inherited, it gave it a presence in Wales. It, 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 that's the thing is that everyone thinks of um, 
the big four companies all having their own um, set regions. But actually, it was a lot more complicated than that. Like you also saw the LMS reach down into um, South Wales because the LNWR had the cross valley, the, the heads of the valleys line, which ran between Merthyr and Abergavenny. Um, they also had um, the Tredega Valley branch line, um, Sahoe Valley, I should say. And also the, the LMS also went out to the Midland Railway, which also had a presence in South Wales and in Swansea. So, um, yeah, it is fascinating to read through the history of it. Ah, yeah. So, yeah, it was the, um, what is now the Wrexham and Bidston line or part of the Wrexham Bidston line, uh, which was the Wrexham Bolden Connors Key Railway, which um, was part of what became the Great Central Railway. And then that passed into the LNER. So that's that's the um, the long and short of it, Jamie. Any further questions? Oh, there's a um, a follow up question. Just you mentioned that the LNER has stations in Wales. I was slash where was this? Oh, can't change uh, off the top of your head. <laughs> uh, there are a couple of more questions there. Oh, yeah, I can see now because for some reason it's hidden them all for me. It's, it's quite difficult to see. So, yeah, it, it said it was. Um, it was it, it was as part of the um, as part of this branch line, the um, between Wrexham and Connors Key. So um, it, it was because it was part of the Great Central Railway. The Great Central Railway was one of the main constituent railways in the uh, LNER when it was formed. Um, and that meant that the LNER had a way of getting into Wrexham. So obviously the Wrexham area, like South Wales, is a big coal mining area, a uh, big industrial area with the Brimbo Steelworks. And, um, you know, it was all of the, even, even when they were kind of these nationally organized but still privately run companies, they all still wanted to kind of compete with each other for these resources if they had a way of doing so. So, so having that company presence there, you know, it, it saved them a lot of money and track access or, well, made it possible because track access was expensive. If you were trying to run on another company's railway lines it was very, very expensive. So um, didn't happen very often. See, there's another, and, another question. Yeah, another question from Robert Bryn Jones. Um, do you want me to read it out? Can you see it okay? Yeah, if you could read it out, then yeah. yeah so it says, yeah, if the so if the CVL project is successful, will this form the basis for TFW taking responsibility for the whole of Wales network and gaining responsibility for the developing network? Um, obviously, uh, this is a matter of sort of, um, so the political position of the Welsh government is that they would like to take on more of the Welsh railway network from the UK government um, so that they can spend, uh, invest in upgrading the railway lines of Wales, because as many of you will be aware, um, lines like the North Wales coast and the Marches line, they have out of date signalling. Uh, lower line speeds, they're not electrified. It means that they're kind of falling behind some of the other key railway lines in the country that are now being upgraded. And if we were able to, to if, if Wales was able to take ownership of these lines, they'd be able to upgrade them, which would mean uh, better services. However, at the moment, they're part of the main national network owned by the UK government and have to um, sort of wait in the queue behind other English um, for investment. Obviously then any transfer is a matter of negotiation between the Welsh and UK governments. So uh, the Welsh government would like to do it. The UK government um, hasn't yet uh, made a decision. So uh, until politically it's all resolved, then you know we just have to kind of transform uh, the aspects 
of uh, the rail service that we can control, which is bringing in new trains and improving stations and working closely with network rail and upgrade projects like, for instance, on the Ebervale line, where the doubling is um, ongoing, which will then allow us to introduce more frequent service to Ebervale. So at the moment, it's just a case of um, wait and see, really. Great, thanks for that. Um, and yeah, thanks um, guys for the questions as well. I th think that is the last one. Um, yeah, just to let everyone know that it has been, um, the session has been recorded today and we'll make that available for you. And um, yeah, I don't know if you've got any parting words James. Well, aside from saying thank you for everyone for coming, I mean, if anyone wants to get in touch with me, uh, if you have any further questions you have to follow up with, my email address is james.bennett at youngrailpro.com. That's my YRP email address. Uh, if anyone's interested in joining the committee as well, please uh, get in touch. It'd be great to see some of you at the social on Thursday evening, which uh, you can sign up for on the website, as we mentioned earlier. Great. Well, yeah, on behalf of all of us, thank you, James, for yeah, brilliant, informative presentation and um, answering all our questions. And um, yeah, hope to see you all in the near future. Okay. Thanks, James. Thank you. Ciao.